Hi everyone, my name is Simon Owen and I'm in the Power Platform Centre of Excellence at Avenard. Welcome to Dynamics Kong. This is an absolutely amazing conference with excellent coordination, great topics, great speakers, and really, really proud to be here. Make sure you're taking part in the chat as we go through this because we'll be monitoring it and there to answer any of your questions. I'm going to hand you over to my friend and colleague, Liz. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Pham. I'm super excited to be here. This is actually my first Dynamics Con ever, and who better to present with my colleagues here from Avanad. Um, at Avanad, I'm a Power Platform Solution Architect, so I love finding problems and solving them with Power Platform. Off to you, Chris. Hey, thanks Liz, thanks Simon. Right folks, welcome to Dynamics Con. Really stoked to be here. I think this is my third one. And a big shout out to the Dynamics Con team. As always, literally the most professional bunch to work with. Listen, folks, get your butts into that chat. It's really important that you start talking. We will be there monitoring it. I can't guarantee you'll get much sense out of us. So let's make this awesome. Let's have a bit of fun. I can't guarantee this presentation is going to go as planned, but you know what? We're going to roll with it. Um, Simon's leading this whole thing, which is going to be great, right? So anyway, as I said, Microsoft, Simon, over to you. <laughs> Good luck, folks. Here we go. Hey folks, so hopefully some of you recognize that as being the, a clip from the end of Men in Black. And we were talking about this in the office the other day and thinking about how similar it is to the Power Platform. And I'm sure you can all see that just, just with your own eyes, but let me give you a bit of explanation just in case you can't. So in the movie, there's, there's this phrase, the galaxy is on Orion's belt. And they look up in the sky at the space and they think, well, it can't be on the Orion's belt because that's just three stars up there in space. But actually what they're talking about is the whole galaxy is in a little jewel the size of a, mar a marble and it's attached to a cat's necklace. So we started talking about that and, and everything that we look at is, is a different way of looking at the world. I look at it different to Chris, Chris looks at it different to Liz and the same is true with the power platform. And that's how we want to tell this story and, and help you look beyond the app and look at things in a different way. So it's all about trying to broaden out, out the way that we look at the world. It's the way that we're, we, we look at awareness and perception of the world and especially the power platform world. So join us as we look beyond the app. Now we're gonna do this in the, the form of a, a, a fun story really. So hopefully you'll be entertained as well as learning some stuff along the way. And these are the characters that we're gonna play. So, so I'm gonna be a narrator through the story. I'm governance guy. So I'm, I'm interested in setting up the platform, running the admin processes, make sure that it's effective as possible and try and make it as useful as possible for people. In a minute, you'll get an introduction from leader lady Liz. So she's our business sponsor. She, she's got some ideas around the platform and how it should be used. And Chris is Maker Man. He's, he's a, an advanced citizen developer. So we're going to hear what his view of the world is around the Power Platform too. And we're going to take you beyond the app. In an epic tale shrouded with mystery, loaded with action and saturated with suspense, could they work together? Would there be a future? Could they own all the walls and see beyond the app? <laughs> that was an incredible rendition of movie voice, man. I'm going to say, <laughs> would be so proud of you right now. <laughs> so, so first of all, let's let's hear from leader lady Liz and see what her view of the world is for power apps. Thank you, Simon. Hi, everyone. I am your leader, Lady Liz. I am the one with all of the big ideas. If it's possible, you name it, I'm going to say, let's go do it. So as leader, Lady, I'm always focused on delivering value to the customers, uh, to the employees and stakeholders. 
And there was once when I watched this Microsoft video where I saw someone that worked at an airport build an app and I had this brilliant idea where I was like, what if, what if we automate 1 million manual hours? Sounds possible, doesn't it? <laughs> so this is a great idea that I had. I'm thinking, okay, maybe some digital transformation. Why don't we add in some agile? That seems to be a hot word, user experience. And then the best part is low code, no code, which to me means everyone can build something. So that's screaming efficiency, that's screaming solving so many problems. And at the end of the day, we're creating the best customer user experience that I and we and all of us could ever create for anyone. Seems reasonable, right? All seems very reasonable. But even with this big idea, I do recognize that there's a little bit of thing that we might need to consider like security, governance, uh, maybe, you know, some app sprawl. Shadow IT, I don't know, maybe the cost, you know, some pretty important things, but I think the idea is worth pursuing. So that said, uh, you know, I'd love to get Maker Man's perspective on what he thinks of this idea. Thanks, Liz. That's really good. So we've got some big ideas in the company to really change the world with the power platform, some, some bold ambitions there, but some recognition that there's some challenges too. So I wonder what Maker Man's view of the world might be. Oh my gosh, one million hours. I, you know, guys, I remember that time somebody watched a Microsoft video and decided it was a good idea to try and make a power app solve all their problems. Uh, anyway, you know, guys, hey, what's up? I'm Maker Man. I magically make stuff happen when I just think about it. The thing that excites me the most, right, is when business users come to me and ask me to transmogrify their idea into something cool. Now, if you don't know what the word transmogrify means, it means to magically change or create, right? So yeah, that's what I do. I make cool stuff even cooler. I take ideas and make them real. And I take things in the digital world and make them more amazing. I am Maker Man. Now, what are some of the challenges that you see when, when doing that, Chris? Oh, Simon, there are no challenges when I do things because I'm an advanced citizen developer. When I do I things... I like to hear that. Yeah, when I do things in Power Platform because I'm advanced, I can do anything. I don't need data. <laughs> I don't need rules. I can create anything I want. Make a man to the rescue. Things that what about those requirements, though, that some of those users, some of those people with the grand ideas like Liz, what, what, what challenges do you have with some of those? Oh, governance guy, you know what? I, I don't, requirements just baffle me completely. I've worked on a lot of power platform projects, which includes power apps, obviously. And I've been through the ringer on people telling me they want to save money. They would like to automate processes and even digitally transmogrify the way that their businesses work. The thing that I can't get out of my head is that sometimes people don't understand what the platform's all about. They watch the Microsoft videos and assume that somebody can make an app in a minute, which is kind of true. Is it useful? We don't know yet. So those business requirements just need to be a bit clearer. I just need a little bit more information. Sometimes I feel the people asking for things don't do the reading and don't do the research. Now, as a maker myself, I like to do all of the possible. So what I'm really hoping is Leader Lady Liz can take these requirements and try and bring them to light for me a little bit later. And it sounds like you're, you're, you've made loads and loads of solutions in the Power Platform. Uh, are, you, are you heavily in demand? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I just recently came off a project with a certain space company I cannot mention any names about, where I created a UFO app. And this UFO app turned UFOs into IFOs, identified flying objects. Yes, when your friend throws that Tupperware dish at you or throws that pineapple at you, you can use artificial intelligence, take a photo of that moving object and learn and figure out what it is based on our unique and crafty AI skills. So that is my most recent solution. In fact, it actually won an award at the most recent Microsoft conference, Microsoft Business Applications Summit with its incredible, credible user experience. I even opened and started the app with a GIF. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> I, I've heard you're pretty famous 
about you're pretty famous for using uh, unusual color combinations as well. That must be good for users, it's, right? It's, it's, it's not because I have any. It's, it's purely because I have no taste rather than no talent, and I like to get that to light with everyone all the time. The other thing that makes me incredibly excited though is to take all these awesome digital bricks in the platform and stick them together. Now, I don't normally tell my friends this, but uh, I play with Lego. And you know what? The Power Platform reminds me so much of playing with Lego. It really does. It's like taking those digital bricks, snapping them together, and really getting a solution out that works really well. The only thing is, I get frustrated sometimes because people think low code means low complexity. So people think that we kind of just dust our magic dust on top of the technology and it automatically creates something stunning and beautiful. But actually, that does take skill and time. If you look at these requirements from my UFO solution that I had created, it wasn't done just by me. I had a team of qualified engineers, excellent user experience folk, as well as some minions to bring us some coffee. I was the minion. However, <laughs> it's pretty important to know that it didn't just take one thing. It's never as simple as it sounds. I always think to myself when I look at the Power Platform, you know, we have this awesome set of digital bricks that you, we can use to create magical things. But again, it's not as simple as just snapping them together. There's logic and thought behind a lot of this. So that's why I get excited about it. But again, I can only do what the business requirements tell me to do. If I don't have a Lego manual, I'm going to build what's in my mind. And hey, man, look around me. Do you really want that? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, thanks for thanks for telling us that story, Chris. So it sounds like we've got a bit of conflict there. So we've got some big ideas, some big dreams, but they're kind of woolly. We haven't really got those defined as requirements. We've got Chris, he's got a bucket load of skills. He's got got that advanced citizen developer set of skills. Perhaps advanced a little maker. bit of concern. Huh? Advanced maker, not citizen developer. Oh, advanced maker. Yeah. <laughs> um, but maybe some concern about those real citizen developers suddenly being unleashed on the, the platform and what kind of chaos it could cause. So I think we need to drill into this conflict a little bit deeper. So without further ado, fight. Oh, I'm so excited. I get to take a <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's on. It's, on. it's that time. Oh. I didn't practice this. <laughs> Bring it on, Maker Man. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> need a lady, Liz. I need a favor. As much as I like this plan, I just don't understand what you want. I mean, how did you benchmark a million hours? That's a great question. Uh, I was watching a movie and someone just said, one million. And I was like, one million? That's a great oh. idea. We should do one million hours. It seems attainable in a certain period of time, maybe a long period of time, but I found it interesting. It's the problem worth pursuing, isn't it? Kind of need big visions to kind of go somewhere, right? I you don't think what? it's that far fetched. You've seen far too many Austin Power films where the guy's like, one million dollars. It literally just comes from nowhere. I mean, it's a random number. When we try and build things in the platform, we always want to try and benchmark them against something that's going to be successful. Right. So a million hours, let's say let's at least we've got something in the back. I kind of respect that. And at least you have ambition. But we need to think of a way to benchmark benchmark that in a better manner and actually build something that's going to be successful. As much as I want to do everything, and I know you want to build everything, it's not going to cut the mustard. I know from experience building out solutions that a canvas app built in 30 seconds doesn't solve everyone's problem. You know, putting data in a SharePoint list certainly doesn't solve everyone's problem. Uh-oh, SharePoint crowd going nuts in the chat. Uh -huh. But that's really important to understand. It's a collection of things. It's not just an app. And I would love to build it all. But again, I don't have all the time in the world. I mean, I've got three crazy children that I know of. You know, it's a bit scary. But, I mean, so would you be able to work potentially? We could figure out a better way to do this. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I guess, uh, you know, when we think about 1 million, it is quite lofty, but I do have some ideas on things that we can start with right now. Would you be interested in hearing those? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm dead keen. Perfect. Okay. First idea. All of us have spaceships, right? That's how we get to work. Yeah. All of us always have to walk outside, peer off into the distance. Is that charger free right now? Like, should I, should I go, can I move my car or move my spaceship? Is it going to be possible? But then as you make your way out that door, you see a spaceship swoop in and take that spot from you. How painful is that? Now imagine 
if we could build an app where you can schedule like, hey, I'd like to charge my car at this time slot. And it tells you in Teams, in offline mode and on your mobile, <laughs> that you could schedule the time you're going to charge your spaceship. I think it would be a big time saver because it would allow people to, you know, work more efficiently because they're not taking time away from their important work to go check to see the spot is open. I think it's a great idea. You seem disgruntled. What's wrong? No, the moment somebody brings up Canvas apps in offline mode, I start getting weird. It's, uh, it's like I've got a bug on me somewhere. I mean, it's, it's all right. It's pretty decent. But you would think that they'd have proper Wi-Fi in space by now, you know? Come on. You better sort their lives out. But look, to be honest, it's, 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 it is an awesome requirement. It sounds like a really good fit for the Power Platform. We could definitely take those charging points and log them in an asset register. We could actually even set up bays. You know, there was a solution that this one company I won't name created called the back to work solution. What? And it's kind of similar because you have people booking desks and booking times. Now, I know this is like years from now, but we could do something similar. You know, we could actually have a, a booking schedule where we could create that. Now that's going to work. Except your offline requirement, we're going to need to talk about that. Because if we're going to be taking, I don't know, in the future, what's bigger than a terabyte, a multi-billion terabyte or something? I don't know. We're going to make up some terminology right now. But that's how big data is going to be. Can your mobile exobyte. device... Exobyte. Hey? Exobyte. Exobyte. Uber exobyte. <laughs> there we are. Sounds like, sounds like a hamburger. Is your device able to cater for that? We don't know, right? So again, great idea. We need to drill into those requirements and figure out a little bit more around how this needs to be stuck together. Okay, and actually, is it going to be, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the time spent on the solution really worth actually having the solution in the first place? In my example, in my scenario, absolutely, absolutely. So what I'm hearing is it could be possible. That's all I need. Anything's possible with enough time, money, and enthusiasm, my friend. Perfect. I can bring the enthusiasm. Okay. So that's the first idea. I know going with one idea is not always the best idea. So I did come up with some alternative options. The second idea is, you know how we have that Space Kitty conference coming up to like showcase our new shoes that are coming out? How cool would it be if you have previously bought a pair of sneakers, let's say last year or last release? They come to the booth, they scan a QR code, and then they punch in their email address so we can find their account and their invoices to verify that they did in fact buy a pair of shoes last year at the event. And if we find it within milliseconds, we can tell them, congratulations, you get a pair of our not revealed yet, limited edition Space Kitty sneakers, 5,000. What? Wait, you're talking about the conference where Craig from Accounts got horribly hammered on that uh, Pangalactic Goggle Blaster stuff, right? Yeah, he's so excited. Every time, man. I, you know, I, I love Craig. He's cool. He, he's awesome. I believe Imagine you. how happy he would be. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're like, oh, my God, I won. I believe you bought five <laughs> pairs of the previous sneakers. This is actually definitely a winner. The only thing I have to ask you is where is the data? Where is it currently stored? Because we need to know where it is so we can get to it and actually either build the app on top of it or integrate it to another data storage facility. So there'll be quite a bit of automation here as well. I have a saying, the best user interface is no user interface. So automate as much as we can, right? Hmm. This is definitely that works well with your design skills as well, doesn't it, Chris? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm dead excited about this idea, and I do. Are you? Did I? Did I tell you though where their email stored is on an on-premise server? Oh, every just time. Just to make this more exciting. Every time, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? This one we can actually just lug a server box around us on our back and have it powered by those special nuclear cubes that we bought that Craig got when he got drunk on Pangalactic Goggle Blasters and went to that weird shop up the... Anyway, we can definitely do that, right? However, on-prem gateways, yeah, you see, that's a good point. We're going to need to start thinking about the on-prem gateway connector. There's a lot of work that goes, that goes into that. And also, so you said that you needed the data in milliseconds. That's going to have scalability issues because of the connector, right? So from a technical perspective, it is doable, but you're going to sacrifice a lot of the actual scalability of the solution and usability of the solution based on where the data is. So again, something we can dive into and really think a bit, of what, a bit more about how to make the solution better. I forgot to tell you one requirement. Oh. Can it be offline? Because you know how conferences go? 
the Wi-Fi gets bogged down. Oh, it can't. <laughs> Everyone's like, but I want to be that booth that can still deliver on that promise that you can win a pair of limited edition shoes. So actually, we do have a solution depending on the type of solution, right? And depending on the data being stored. I will tell you that Canvas, Canvas apps actually do have an offline mode that you can use. It's not massively amazing, or, or, but you can actually take tools like Dataverse completely offline as well with a fully structured relational database, which is pretty cool. So this is a good use case. The spatial charging one is too light for that type of scenario. This one may actually just be right, but it's also going to depend on the number of users and things. So now what okay. we're doing, I feel like we're putting these into a complexity matrix. I'm pretty excited. So you're telling me it's possible. Anything's possible with enough time. That's all I want to hear. That's all I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Last idea. I think this is the grandest idea I have of all of them. I think it's almost up there with the one million hours thing, right? So I'm not trying to intimidate anyone in this room. <laughs> but... You know, with Power Platform, that really amazing video I saw where they told me, like, anyone can build a power app, a flow. Sounds really magical. And, you know, I'm a believer in magic. And, you know, I think it would be so cool if within our organization, everyone had the ability to use Power Platform. So I'm thinking citizen developers, like all 30,000 of us. All 30,000 of you? All 30,000. <laughs> One million hours, 30,000 people. I think we can get to one million if we all could build things. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty okay with that. However, just not Craig. That guy in those pangalactic goggle blasters. Every time, you know, he's built some weird stuff, man. But let me, let me explain. So, citizen development is kind of a misthought thing that happens in the world right now. Often, what people think is that just because you can make an Excel document, you can make a really complicated solution. Canvas apps are a small part of the power platform. They are a useful part, but they are a small part. They're not everything to everyone. In fact, the whole platform is kind of focused more on data and connectivity than Canvas apps. So we have to completely think outside of that. Now, in my world, right, I just care about building the solution. That's what I want. I just want to create the solution. I want to use the tech, okay? And that's all I'm really thinking about right now is kind of using the tech to solve the problem. But I know I have to try and match the tech to the problem. And I can see you've done some work on your design board over here. Oh, yeah. Thank you, you Simon. Probably, I've worked on this for a very long time. I have so many videos, so many books. Talking about I, all my friends had to map out the future. Looks great, yeah. doesn't it? It's color-coded, yeah, too. You have a picture of me outside my house on there. <laughs> That's super weird. Why is my cat there? I, I really don't know. Space Kitty, I need a mascot. That's it. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out here because these ideas are cool. I'm trying to come up with solutions, but you keep on throwing curveballs at every move. First, it's offline. Then it's on-prem data. Now it's citizen, citizen what are they called? The, 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 that word, right? Those people, those people, okay? And now they're going to be accessing all my stuff as a maker. That's not cool. I'm, I'm panicking. I'm panicking. What exactly am I supposed to be doing here? Like, all of a sudden, you're going to unleash these people on all my things and give them access to them. And now they're going to trash all my stuff. They're going to break all my cool flows. I've got automations that take place every day. I've got scheduled things. I've got dates all over the place. I've got connectors that can be shared. And whoa, now whoa, 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 whoa. <coughs> so you guys, I can hear you shouting at each other down the, down the corridor. What on earth is going on? <laughs> Simon, she won't listen. Simon, I have really good ideas. Would you like to hear them? Maybe later. I've heard your ideas before, I think. <laughs> Have you? They've changed. They're even better now. I've had time to refine them. Uh, uh, don't, do not listen to her, Sabi. She wants to take all our corporate data that's private offline on, on Craig's phone. Craig, the guy from accounts. <laughs> oh, wasn't he the guy who had all the pangalactic gargle blasters? That's him, man. That's Craig. Yeah. I know that guy. <laughs> he's a great guy, actually. He's fun to go out with. He's cool. Yeah, he's pretty cool. So I, I overheard some of your conversation as I was walking up the hall, and, and it sounds like you both got some valid concerns. You got some frustrations there, Liz, that you, you think it should be easier than perhaps it is. And and uh, if you'd listen to some of what Chris was saying, it's it's not as easy as some of those videos shows. It, it can be quite difficult. You're right that there's a real opportunity for us to save loads of money, 
get everybody involved across the organization and and really deliver on that big value but it's it's not easy we should we shouldn't think that it is otherwise we're just lining ourselves up for a, a big custard pie in the face really so chris i was listening to you as well and and absolutely agree just because it's loco doesn't mean it's low complexity it's not just about the app. We've got to think bigger than that. We've got to think about the data. We've got to think about the people. We've got to think about the whole organization and how we change around it. And educating all of those citizen developers, all 30,000 of us across the organization, and getting them to a level where they're able to develop, it is challenging, but I think we can do it. I think if we look at this in the right way, we can actually deliver on all of these things and, and loads more as well. So let me share my idea on what some of our first steps are, and I'd love to get some of your input as we go as well. So I think we need to look at that broader vision. So, so I've heard that you want to use IT de developers, advanced makers, citizen developers. So we've got to have a strategy around that. We need to look at who all of those people are. What are they trying to get out of the platform? What are we trying to achieve as an organization? We're going to define those goals and really make it clear what we're trying to do. We've got to then have a look at the platform and see, well, how do we set it up in this scalable way so that each of those groups can do stuff, but actually not unleash all our data to the world and connect Twitter to, to all our corporate secrets. We've got to make it be sensible and we can configure that platform to do exactly that stuff. So we can also monitor on all of that and understand, well, are things going smoothly or where do we need to intervene to help people or get them get them some help to do the right thing? And that links in with the governance processes. So one size doesn't fit all. If we're looking at some of these complex situations, which are using personal data and, and maybe some of those external connectors like Twitter, that's not necessarily the same governance as as. Maybe Craig, actually, if he's creating a SharePoint list and just doing something, creating an app or some flows on top of it just to help him and his team, different different scales. So we should look at different scales of processes to accommodate those. Mate, you have, you have met okay. Craig, right? Well, yeah, Craig's a bit of a challenge. Maybe we should, um, maybe we should give him extra help. Um, and, the, and that kind of falls into that nurture topic as well. So each of those groups are going to have different needs. The, the really techie guys, they're going to understand some of the data sources and application lifecycle management and, and some of the formality that needs to go through these really serious solutions. But people like Craig, we can help them get going, can't we? Yeah, I definitely want to get help Craig going and more people like Craig, right? So this all sounds really great, Simon. How long will it take before cool. we can realize the vision? So I, I think it's a question of putting the minimum level of governance in place at first. So we've got to look at what's important to us as a company. We've got to look at the personal data. We've got to look at the security of our data because we're not just keeping the organization and the data safe. We're keeping the people safe. So we've got to make sure that those guardrails are in place first. And then we can look at what's the next steps that we need to do before we can start rolling it out to a smaller set of makers and start testing some of these ideas with them. So do it in a real bite-sized way, in an iterative way. And, and it's really that agile approach that you spoke about. And, and I'm not sure you understood when you uh, shared your vision at the beginning. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I want to make sure people can build safely. That is very important to me. And I want to make sure people like Craig can do what he needs to do and really unleash, you know, the creativity that you can have with the platform. So, yeah, I think that that makes sense to me. And really, thank you for bringing that to light, because at the end of the day, I want to make it fun for Chris, too. It's not just about Craig. It's also about, you know, our advanced makers. Like, how do they understand how to use the platform and also have all these processes so we can keep our data safe. That's awesome, Liz. I'm glad you're, you're starting to see that perspective too. I, I, I want to pick your brains on something actually. So when Chris was talking, he, um, he mentioned that he loves to just jump in there and start creating the solutions, really getting hands on and, and kind of hands on keyboard and solving those problems as quickly as possible. But, but you mentioned something about user experience and experience design. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So sometimes when we build solutions, 
we think, okay, we understand the problem. We'll, we'll make it work. And what making it work means when you do a thing, it does what it's supposed to do. But sometimes when you make it do the thing, it might be from the perspective of, oh, I've accomplished that task. But then if you handed it off to somebody else, could they complete that same action with the same outcome? Or would they end up in a situation where let's say they might have thought this field was for reconciling some, you know, sum of money, but really it was sending money to someone else and then they hit send. Now you may have lost money. That's not a good situation. So I often like to think that we can work towards enabling everyone to think about the end user and really what the problem is that we're trying to solve here before we send it off and say, hey, let's go ahead and build this. So it's really important to consider the user experience because we can build all the most amazing things that we want, right? But at the end of the day, if you gave it to someone else to use it and they can't figure it out, have we really solved the problem? So yeah, that really helped. So some of the things uh, I think about, you know, when I'm trying to draft up requirements in order to work with makers like Chris is, okay, I need to help Chris understand the situation. So think of this as like kind of lay of the land, giving him the background and the context. Who are the players that are involved? Because as we all know, everything exists within this system of relationships. So if I'm building something for, let's say, you, Simon, I would need to explain like, hey, Simon is working with these people when he does this specific task, right? So that helps Chris go, oh, okay, so there's multiple people involved. I should consider that. And then I can give him a little bit more, you know, coloring and say, hey, you know, this is the type of person we're looking at. You know, we're looking at what, what's his name, Samu, you know, our resident alien uh, fellow coworker. How do we make it good for him? Like, what's his thing? He really is a fan of the idea of charging a spaceship. So obviously he's like, you know, I go out there 15 times a day. I come back sad every time. It would be so nice if we had the solution. Yeah. And then from there, it's really starting to map. What are the touch points that Samu would start to walk, go through, right? So that way Chris can go, oh, so there's a cookie thing that happens here. And then I have 10 seconds to do something here. And then a screen that says, congratulations, you have done, done what you needed to do. And how people feel good about, you know, trying out this new piece of tech, but also being able to do what they think that it should do, right? So that's all exciting. But this comes in another question, right? We're building one app in an ecosystem. So when people have all these great ideas, including myself, I'm guilty of it. I come up with all these great ideas, but I'm thinking in a silo. I'm not thinking about how, if we build this thing, does that thing actually already exist somewhere else? Do I have to start from scratch all the time? Or can I say, hey, can, can I take a look at your solution? Maybe we can pull some ideas and either, either make yours better or create a replacement, right? But then outside of that, if something already exists, and we change it, how does that impact everything else that might be touching that older solution? So there's a ripple effect that can occur. I often think of, uh, has anyone here played um, Cat's Cradle, where you have this closed loop, this string, you pull the string in one direction, something else happens on the other side. Same thing here happens with your portfolio technology. You make a change here, and if you don't realize the dependencies, sometimes you might be lucky and it's nothing major, but other times it's like, oh no, what has happened here? <laughs> and we don't want that. So it's just something to consider is it's one thing to build an app, but then when you put that app into its ecosystem, how is it playing with everything else? That's really awesome. That, Chris, is that something that you've heard of before? Is that, is that new new to you or what do you think? No, it's, it's, a very, it's a very good point because a lot of the time when we hear these requirements, the first thing we do is we start looking across the business for, for stuff that looks similar. and um, that's the first point. I always think that in our world, you know, with tech and where we come from, from a technology perspective, it's something that we do, we do want to reuse and we want to make sure that other people can reuse. And from perspective, I often, we, and I said it in the previous session with a leader lady, is that when we start talking about these types of solutions, you know, the best user, user interface is no user interface sometimes. And it's always good to understand who is asking for, for the requirements and asking for it and why. And that's why I was very interested in a million hours being saved because actually who is that directly connecting to and in what way, shape or form? Right? Like, how are you going to benchmark that? And if that's easy to do, you're probably not going to save a million hours. Okay. So yeah, in our, in our world, from a technology perspective, we always want to correlate, make that correlation right between the benchmark and the, and the thing it's going to do and save and who is going to use it and actually what tech is really important. But sometimes we keep forgetting that it's not just about a thing. It's the wider landscape. 
Is that what does that mean to you, Liz? Do, is that something that that you've thought about before as well? I mean, just having this conversation has been really nice. You know, working with Maker Man Governance Guides, helping me understand how, yes, one million hours automated is possible, but is it likely going to be achieved today, tomorrow, even a year from now? Probably not. But hearing what the team has to say, I think. I think there's a way for all of us to come together where I could do better at providing requirements and starting to map out these relationships. And from my side, providing perspective into the business on where some of these high level dependencies lie. So that way, when we do engage with someone like Maker Man Chris, he's like, okay, thanks for giving me a four double one. You know, I'll take it from here. I'll dig underneath the hood now. So what I'm helping him with is solving kind of the people interactions on the upper layer. And that way, Chris, he can focus on solving the problems, you know, underneath on like, how do we actually technically make this thing work? Uh, Alina, are you saying I'm not a people person? No, I'm not saying you're not a people person. I'm just saying <laughs> experience may not be on top, on top of mine. <laughs> they have a saying, delegate uh, your weaknesses. So if, I'm, if I can help you in that area, by all means, definitely let me know. And now I have weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> I have weaknesses too. <laughs> it sounds like we've 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 all learned something today, and we've all kind of got a little bit closer together and, and recognised that actually by working together we can we can solve these problems more effectively and, mm -hmm. and more strategically. So I think I think we can surprise <laughs> we we can uh, <laughs> celebrate. This is terrifying. Power PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> is this what happens when we put you in charge of the PowerPoint? Power Potter. Yeah, sorry. Wave your wand. <laughs> Power Potter and his, and his amazing uh, slide. That's, that's scary, man. <laughs> Cool. So, so folks, so hopefully you, through us having a bit of bit of fun and telling the story, you've seen that the, the message that we're trying to share is that by broadening our horizons, broadening our awareness and perceptions, we're actually able to understand other people's viewpoints. And it's, it's the same with every part of the life, really. But from a power platform perspective, it's really, really valuable to really get to the right answer. And we started off thinking about this in, in kind of the physical world. So we've got folks out there who know about subatomic particles, they know about elements, they know about molecules, they're, they're, their language is the periodic table. But actually, as you, you kind of talk to more people, that level of perception and awareness, it, it varies. So we've all got different ways of looking at the world. And that might be kind of the molecules, it might be the, the, the idiots like what we are on the screen that those molecules then make up could be that you're only aware of your own country or or state or the world but but there's people out there looking at the whole universe and thinking about the multiverse we've all got this different way of looking at things and and there's value to be had in kind of broadening our perspectives to do that so by using that that kind of theory about the physical world we then thought about it from a, a power platform perspective so down at a, an element and a molecule perspective You've got the different solutions in the power platform, the different applications. You've got, got PCF controllers, you've got custom connectors, you've got dataverse schemas, you've got security models, you've got all the building blocks that you can bring together. Those make up that power platform almost periodic table. Other people are looking at the business unit. So they're looking at their business problems. They're looking at, well, where could the power platform fit? How could I use this tool and, and these capabilities that my teams are building to deliver value? Then you've got the folks who are looking at it from an organization perspective and say, oh, well, I've invested all this time and money and I've got all these licenses. How actually do I get that return on investment? What's, what's that strategic capability that I'm trying to develop to really change my business? And then you can extend that further and, and start looking across industries and see, well, are there any themes? Are there any things that we can look at? You, you could uh, extend that into the product groups around the tools as well. And well, what's their view of the world? So we're all looking at the, the same thing, but in different ways. We've all got different parts of the puzzle that we're bringing. And the, in our example, a big chunk of how we enable that is that governance layer. So what we've tried to do here is just to 
to pull together a periodic table of what that looks like. And you'll see that there's different columns that stand for different things. And some of those are, are some of the objectives that Liz had, like agile and an experienced design. Some of them are the, the, the more technical pieces around the tools themselves. There's things like environment strategy and DLP that we need to configure and we need to get right. But as you go down the, the rows, go down those different groups, actually the, that knowledge builds. You don't need all that knowledge in one go. These are building blocks of knowledge on understanding how the whole platform works and how we could kind of set up support models for these and how we can make things scalable so that we don't overwhelm everything with the wrong scale of governance and squash any adoption. By getting all of these things right and broadening our horizons and by talking to other people and helping them understand these different elements, we can be really successful in rolling out the platform and really make it that strategic capability that we all want it to be, as well as delivering those individual solutions, which is where people see that, that value in their hands. So hopefully you've seen through the storytelling, through some of the thinking that we, we, we've kind of described at the end there, it's this looking at things in different ways and looking beyond the app that will make us really successful with the Power Platform. I hope you've enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And a big shout out again to all the Dynamics Con folks and everyone for voting for us. It's been epic. Power Potter, you're awesome. Liz, you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much. This is my very first Dynamics Con, and it's been a blast to be in. It's such an honor to be at an event like this. It's been really fun. It's always fun working together. It's, it's so great that we're all in the same team. It's just nonstop craziness and uh, and silly ideas and, and concepts that we're brainstorming <laughs> all the time. So, yeah, I love it. Thank you, everyone. See you in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hey everyone, thanks for thanks for joining us. That was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I always 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 love presenting at this event because the crowds the crowds pretty crazy. Um, there'd be some insane insane things going on in the chat. I even got the little scroll arms out for it. Um, but yeah, what did you guys think? Did you enjoy that? This Simon. Yeah. 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 I love it. So much fun. Was it? I know there's so much good stuff going on in the chat. Like I saw a lot of people commenting on things that resonated with me, such as, you know, you bring in someone new and we're building new apps and not everyone's building all the same apps. Um, I'd love to get everyone's perspective here on, you know, how, how do we actually manage app sprawl? You know, like you have someone new that's excited, but how do they get connected to even know about other stuff that's being built? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the thing, the thing that I found interesting. So, Azure actually made some really good comments, right? And um, I know Simon, like that's that's your sort of sweet spot around because, like, I I don't always believe that giving everyone access to all the apps is the best idea, and all the creativity is the best idea. And you're kind of a bit more lenient than I am. So, what do you reckon? Yeah, I am. I I kind of I'm a bit schizophrenic in this. So so I kind of try and put myself in that view which is maybe three years five years down the line whatever it might be where anybody in the world pretty much has excel today they have word today they have powerpoint today and they're empowered to go off and use those and solve business problems i would love to kind of accelerate the world get into that place where where the power platform is is no different you've got a business problem that you want to solve great i'm going to spin up a power app and and do that it's, there's a way, there's a way to go, um, but but the way I look at governance around that is to enable it rather than to shut it down and to think there's some real simple use cases at the end that it would be lovely if it was the most beautiful app in the world. But for the use case, it's for me and my buddy to use for this this quick one-off thing. It doesn't really matter whether it's the best coded or the best structured or the the, the best app in the world. But if I'm doing something for the organization or I'm doing something that's going to have personal data in it or I need something that's going to support business criticality, well, I need to look after that stuff. I need to treat it with respect. I need to make sure it's brand aligned. I want to make sure it's as user-centric as possible. 
and you've got a whole spectrum in in the middle of that so i i the way i looked at the world when i approached it in in my old role was to say well ideally i'd love anybody to be able to make anything and if they use it for a while or even if they they develop something and it doesn't go into use that's okay too so they they might not have delivered the business value that they set out to deliver but actually they said they developed some knowledge they they developed some experience they've thought in a different way they've opened some doors and some different perception that they might not have had before so i i try and look at the value from that perspective as well awesome so i'm going through i'm going through some of the questions and um i feel like so gene has has asked something really interesting and gene said i hope it's i hope it's gene i hope i'm saying your name correctly because there's also jean so i don't know anyway um so the question is do you have a team to govern the apps what issues what are the issues with app sprawl right so um i know liz simon you both have gone through that process where you've seen some pretty interesting things but maybe liz do you want to take a crack at that and then simon yeah, so having a team to govern the apps, I think it, it really takes a community and standing up. One side is the technical piece, right? How do we get visibility into all the things that exist within your tenant? And then from there, how do you look at that data and say, how do we make a data informed decision on where we even start? So it could be things on like, hey, I'm walking down the environment, I might be doing these other things. But on the flip side, if you're already at the community level where you have citizen developers and you're engaging the business, it's thinking about how do you create services that almost allow these people to self-serve and say, hey, I want to build something. How do I engage to figure out what I need to do? So I think on one side, I guess IT is going to want to lock everything down. But then for me, there's that other side on how do you actually help people understand the rules of the game? So just to frame this up again, if IT is setting the rules for the game, once you're sitting down with all of your friends and like, OK, let's read these rule books, who can help interpret that and point people in the right directions? to be enabled um, in order to enjoy and build other things. I don't know, Simon, what do you think? Yeah, I'm with you. No, I think we always talk about Power Platform as being technology, process, and people. And I think that's where it's really key in this space is that even if you're using the, the platform and giving people access to the to do that, that kind of basic development, those small use cases and structuring your your environments, your DLP, who has access, all that stuff to enable people to do some things. There's a part around setting up the platform to, to kind of enforce those right behaviors, but there's a bit around educating people and say, well, it's okay to, to go off and learn and create stuff, but if you don't need it, tidy up after yourself, keep the platform nice and tidy, same as we would do at home. It's, it, there's a bit of personal housekeeping that needs to go on, which I don't think it, well, I haven't seen too many examples where people are good at that, me included, I must admit. Mm -hmm. so, so I think there's a behavioral bit that we need to get better at as well to help with that. Awesome. Well, look, we've got to wrap, but um, I just wanted to say thanks to both of you. Thanks to the audience. You've been awesome. Um, yeah. And then a real big thanks to the Dynamics Con team. You've been absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. A uh, tiny little squirrel hand clap for everyone. Well done. <laughs> thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye.